Parker, everybody, Weekly Motivation. I want to say this. A lot of people, especially y'all out there with kids already, people go broke for their kids, but they won't get rich for them. They won't build that wealth for them. A lot of times, you know, people get caught up in the whole what's in the glamour and trying to show off and show off to people that and really and truly they don't really care. So what I want to say is stop going out here and getting broke for them. Start leaving a legacy for your kids. Hustle for your last name, man, and don't worry about your first. Leave something behind that's bigger than you. Make an impact that's going to help those that come after you. So at the end of the day, don't worry about going broke for your kids, man. Go get rich and go get wealthy for them. It's a threat there to pass that on down. All right, everybody, we back. Another episode of Understand the Hustle. Got my boy Mark, my boy Devin. Got a special guest. You know, everybody keep asking about all the stuff going on with stock market this and stock market that, stock investing. So I brought my boy Nick on. But go ahead, Nick, just kind of break it down. Give everybody a little bit of background about yourself. I know you got a lot going on, stock investing. You got your own company and stuff. So let's go ahead and give everybody a little background info. Yeah, so real quick, you know, I started stock investing back in 2016. Um, it was mainly in college is when I started to trade. And then I started to kind of shift that day trading mindset more so then, and then started to go into long-term stock offer or long-term investing. And then, uh, that was after, you know, played football at university of Missouri. And then I had a little bit more time to focus on equities and stocks. Then I entered into the energy industry down here in Houston, Texas, uh, worked for a retail electric provider and uh, was an indirect sales manager there. So I dealt with a lot of energy brokers and so leveraged um, a few private equity firms uh, cash to provide these upfront payments in terms of doing sales and getting deals done uh, in short to not try to overcomplicate this. So then I continued to do that. Um, talking with those guys, you know, they opened my eyes to the markets and to a little bit more of a longer term instead of a shorter term mindset. Um, and then as well as, you know, just kind of tapping into that game and, and understanding it and continuing to adapt my strategy and everything else. And then ever since then, you know, continue to try to grow as much as I can. That's kind of my quick little short version somewhat into it. And so I continue to trade um and invest today as much as i can so that's the goal and then i also own uh my own energy brokerage firm called intermark consulting now so that's kind of what i do a lot of it's energy management and everything and then as well as um investing and working with all these guys so all right <clears throat> that Okay, so when you started off trading, was you doing like penny stock? What kind of trade were you doing, like the penny stocks and what? Yeah, so I kind of fell into that whole little trap back in college where you come across this this stock guru, right? And then you look up their information. That's usually how it starts, it seems like, at least. And uh, and I started to follow them. I started trading more of like penny stocks, small cap stocks, so stocks that are underneath about $5, $10. And um you know, it's day trading, you know, they always say what 90, 95% of traders lose yeah. a whole cliche term. Um, and it's almost like gambling to a certain point. I mean, everybody uses technicals and everything. And in my opinion, technicals should just uh, guide you through a stock. They're not an indication of where the stock's exactly going to go. Um, you know, a lot of the technical analysis, technical indicators, are good, but not everybody uses every single technical indicator. The only technical indicator that everybody uses pretty much that you can really base it off of is the VWAP. Um, so, but in doing that in day trading, you know, I started to lose a lot. I won some, lost some, you know, started to post it a lot on my Twitter and everything. And it's really just trying to chase the money rather than trying to make a good trade. And so once I kind of started losing some, you have to adapt the strategy. And um, then I got into a little bit longer term swings or just short term swings. 
and uh, found a lot more success in that. And everybody is different. Everybody has a different strategy and everything like that. Some, you know, more so works for others and, and everything, but quickly realized that the market uh, definitely tests your character quickly. <laughs> you find out how greedy you can be and, and um, if you can hold, hold the stock even through, even though you know your analysis is right. I mean, that's, that's the hardest thing. So it takes a lot of discipline and, and I encourage, you know, taking a lot of practice before that. So. All right. Real, real quick though, for anybody, cause we, this is almost like a stock for dummies type shit. So anybody that may not know like technicals, basically the way I do technical, it's like, you got a chart, you, you know, you have the chart kind of based off the price history and we might do any kind of number of things. I, me personally, I use support resistance, or I might use like a Fibonacci to trace and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Trend lines. Some people go a little bit deeper on uh, RSIs, which is like relative strength index. But just in a nutshell, it, it's just charting. It's like you see a chart, it might have a different time frame. Either it could be if you short term, you might look at like a five minute or something. If you more of a long term, you might look at the three to six months with stocks. And you'll kind of just based on like, you'll just start marking this chart up based on like the price and stuff like that, just for anybody that may not know. Uh, what that is <clears throat> so i think it's, okay so this is different like you like y'all basically you were like commodities like energy is that relatively similar like how does that uh scenario work because i've never i don't really deal with anything but straight stocks and options so yeah i mean typically what i invest in everything is equities but on the energy side i mean the universal term is it's always about supply and demand at the end of the day yeah. right so when it gets colder than normal temperatures, like it is now in, in Houston and Dallas and Texas in general. So for the general Texas market, um, as demand goes up, so as it gets cold, you're gonna turn, more and more people are gonna turn on their heater, right? So there's gonna be more energy consumption and it's all based on how much supply we have off of basically natural gas, how much we've produced and everything during the, the we call it the injection season. So when they inject into the ground to, to develop natural gas, uh, it's typically during the summer, they don't do it, do it during the winter. And um, if there's enough supply to last out the forecasted amount by the, the government or the regulators within our own respective market, then um, demand can often, uh, uh, exceed supply that will drive up prices that will put a lot of pressure on the grid. That's why a lot of people are talking about, there might be a lot of, we call it blackouts. Basically your power may go out um, in a whole huge area. So, so outside of that, you know, it's just all demand and su supply and demand. And that's what drives the price up ultimately at, at the end of the day. Um, we've had so much supply. I mean, I think the U S right now is currently the number one producer for natural gas. So we've had an excess of supply, so it's dri driven down the supply of natural gas. But you know, you got to take all different kinds of fundamentals, meaning uh, the different analysis outside. So regulation, you know, based on the government, based on everything else, um, that's what's going to help determine where the price, where that market is going to go, and then you can uh, adjust accordingly. So, so I guess with, with the energy and all this, what's that? I was saying, so with the energy trading, all, is that more like on an international basis, you know, just, you know, from the U.S., maybe Europe, you know, Middle East and things in that matter? Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of the time, typically energy trading in the U.S. is just involved in the U.S. or a specific geographic area. So a lot of it's just in Texas or up in the Northeast primarily. Mm -hmm. But you do have to take in consideration the whole global standard. So where are we shipping the natural gas out from the U.S.? How much are we shipping out to overseas, to Europe and everything else? How much, does, how much consumption of natural gas is Europe currently consuming? How much are they producing? You know, when you take those factors into place, then you can kind of see where we're at. But right now, since we're ahead of the pack, um, in terms of producing natural gas, then, you know, oftentimes your main focus is going to be in, within the U.S. That might not be the same for like other commodities 
like oil, you know, you got to look at OPEC over in the Middle East and, and everything else where it's being produced the most. That's going to move the prices majority of the time compared to over here in the U.S. So you might want to focus in on oil and the price of oil over there. Gotcha. More than the U.S. So it's the same thing over here. All right. Uh, kind of just let's pivot back around like stock stuff. Was you involved in the uh, – the, the whole GameStop and, and AMC thing? Yeah, I was. So I got in GameStop back when it was about $10.63 was my average, I believe. And that was back in, I think it was September. But, you know, it was my reason that in, at the time, Wall Street, I didn't wasn't part of Reddit. I wasn't part of Wall Street bets or I didn't I never heard of them. Mm -hmm. There wasn't that much craze. But the primary news that came out was um, Ryan Cohen, who was the owner of Chewy.com. It's the yeah. dog food and toy delivery uh, e-commerce site that he sold. I think it was Petco. And correct me if I'm wrong. And so he he invested over, I think, a million dollars into that and then was going to take a board seat. And so a lot of what I was looking at fundamentally for that company, I know that you have the risk of bankruptcy and everything, but it was completely beaten down and a large short interest, meaning a lot of institutions were betting on the stock going down. Um, and I think at the time it was around 70% short of the total stock. And so because there was not a lot of downside and I was using risk and reward, there was more reward than risk and my whole philosophy was, is that when I'm looking at a stock, if I'm holding it, you know, shorter term or swinging it or holding it a little bit longer term, what's my risk reward? You know, if I don't, you know, there's not much more downside to GameStop at the time. Um, and mind you, you know, the gaming industry has grown, expanded in 2020 by 20% 20 to $179 billion with a B. That's double the film industry. That's double any type of related industry that's competing against them, right? And so because GameStop's retail and it's typical in physical form, because Ryan Cohen is such an expert at e-commerce, um, I thought he was going to change the narrative over time. And with gaming teams, people are starting to pump more and more money into that. So if GameStop gets more involved with that and shifts their narrative from you know, buying your games for $2 that <laughs> you bought for 50, oh. um, then that's going to turn the company completely around. And also, mind you, Bill Ackman was one of the, had a lot of shares with his company or hedge fund. And he often buys distressed companies and assets and understanding his nature and everything too. He's going to try to change the narrative. So that's why I invested into GameStop. I just got lucky that I got picked up by Wall Street Bets and mainstream media, and then, you know, got short squeezed, held on to it to about $72 and just took profit. And a lot of people came up to me and they're just like, well, how, how come you didn't hold it longer? How come you didn't hold it longer? Well, profit is profit at the end of the day. And nobody went broke going, taking profit. So, um, so that's why. And then the same narrative, you know, because I saw a caught stream, AMC started to do the same thing. They had fixed assets. So, I knew that was going to get picked up too. So I got in there and then got out. So it's all about momentum too. If, it, if something's going, you know, trending upwards, just ride the wave while you can and, and get in and get out because it's all going to collapse eventually as we've seen with GameStop. Hey man, a few, first off, congrats on that, on that play. But a few things I just want to kind of like note, because a lot of people like you had a whole uh, you had a whole breakdown of it right like you had you did your due diligence this is what this is why i say a lot of people they you know they got caught up on the hype of it all and it's crazy because i'm actually part of wall street bets and i've been for a while and that community jumped from like one two million to eight million yeah <laughs> over the whole course of that which was crazy and um, well first of all let's talk about this like because i people probably be like what the heck is a swing so you have different types of you have trading is not in necessarily the same as investing by trade more so people do that kind of like almost some people do take it as a job side hustle whatever some do it as a career so you have different types of trades you got the scalpers which is more like same as scalpers and day traders are almost similar scalpers is more quick plays like maybe you know you might be in a trade 
five minutes, 15 minutes, might be in their hour. Day trade is more, you know, you're in a trade within the scope of, you know, the day. Then you have your swing traders, which is more so, that seems like what you kind of uh, lean towards as well as long term. And swing trade is more so you're in a trade, you may be in a trade two, you know, a little over a day, you might be in a trade six months, you might be in a trade a year. Uh, then you got the long term investing, you know, anything over a year and a day, technically, uh, you know, and that'll drop your tax implications down, stuff like that. Um, uh, another thing that uh, Nick mentioned was, you know, he looks at the risk and reward. That's a, that's another thing a lot of people don't tend to do. And like you said, a lot of people got on you as far as getting out at 72 bucks a share, but they don't realize that's a seven to one uh, risk to reward right there. So, I mean, most people, I know when I do stuff, when I do long-term options, I'm looking for a 500% return. That's for me, like anything shorter than, you know, um, options under a year, I'm, I'm more so looking for at least a hundred percent return. And then it just depends on the time I have on it. So as far as trading goes, honestly, I'm just looking for about 20 to 30% if I'm like on an intraday uh, perspective. But the, the key thing I want to just point out, like anybody that want to get started in, in the stock market and stuff is just the fact that like Nick had a plan. And a lot of people don't like, I've been beat up by stuff. So I, I know I understand the importance of it. But I just want to draw that, like push a little bit further because a lot of people don't understand that is, that's the key right there, having a plan, understanding not only the technicals, because technicals is good. Like a lot of people, they, they so big on technicals, but they don't know anything about the company itself. So like, I mean, yeah, the technicals may make sense, but the company could be terrible. Like it could be garbage, could not even be worth the worth the risk. So that's just another thing to take into play. He kind of broke, he pretty much gave y'all a whole breakdown of what he looks for with fundamentals far as, um, you know, the financials and stuff like that, the management, who's in charge. Cause it kind of, what it does is it backs your thesis on, you know, like they might have a, you know, they have a moat per se. Like they have things that, you know, are impenetrable or like, and just beneficial to the company overall, like health. And I mean, I shoot, I'm kind of, it was interesting to hear him how he got in the game style. Cause he was in it, you know, I was like before the real crazy wave caught on. And I mean, a lot of people took chances like that and stuff. And I mean, it is what it is. Only thing he really risked was his time at the end of the day. Uh, question, because you mentioned Bill Ackman. Do you do you mess around with SPACs? Uh, a little bit. I mean, there's there's a SPAC craze going on right now. I mean, there was 37 yeah. SPACs created this past week, you know, and it's, it's interesting. And I did mess with some. I mean, they're good. They're a good way to invest, I think, in short term or even just – you know, kind of riding that wave because also understand that the, the stock market often shifts from industry to industry and there's a lot of hype and everything. And if you want to, if you're looking real short term, if you're looking to day trade and everything, look what's going around. I mean, a lot of times there's, there's, you know, weed stocks right now that's popping off like Sundial, SNDL, everybody's talking about that, I think, well. um, you know, then they move to shippers. So you have Globes, you have seen, you know, well, not Sino anymore, but uh, I guess I won't go into those, but you basically it, it shifts and there's momentum plays and you can ride that trend as much as you can. And there's typically at the same time of every single year from my past experience, it usually happens around the same time. So, you know, during the fall around November, uh, October, November is usually when news and everything comes out for like shippers shipping companies, they are often low float stocks, meaning, you know, they have, there's a widespread between the bid and ask. There's not a lot of shares outstanding to the public to trade. And so that creates more volatility. And if there's enough people buying into the stock or enough volume, as we'd say, it could push the stock way up. And so it goes into cycles, I think all the time. So if you're looking for that, and the more you familiar side yourself with these different types of stocks that tend to to rise a lot or tend to run or the people that get onto it then then you can ride that trend as well but that takes time and, and everything looking and a lot of due diligence but i mean that's, that's part of this part of the game too so yeah i think that's big that you mentioned that because i mean uh if y'all just want the like technical term but he's pretty much kind of hitting that as like a seasonality I, I, I do understand like a lot of stuff does have like different um there were time frames when they'll go up. And also like the overall market has, like if you just look at past history, it, it does have a, a, a trend to it. And, you know, it kind of follows a trend. 
especially like a lot of people probably notice like in like August, September, how the market kind of took like a major dip, but that's kind of the, the trend. If you look at like overall stock market, it usually does a correction or a pullback or whatever you want to call it around that time frame. So that that's all, like you said, it's all, it really is just a big game. I mean, it's just who's better at the what, and you have to understand that, like he mentioned institutional money way earlier, like you have to understand how they play into this because they move the market. We don't necessarily, you know, the regular average day person doesn't, you know, move the market. We don't have enough money. You know, you talk about people that's putting millions and, you know, they got billion dollar hedge funds that they put money and pump it into the market. That's going to move the price. You're more so, you know, as on the retail side, like us regular people, we're just trying to kind of follow follow some type of momentum that we see. And I mean, a lot of people, they do that. They'll just follow what we call the whales and that's the big money. And they'll kind of just ride their coattail and get, take their profit and, and keep it moving. But I mean, that takes, Nick can tell you, that takes a lot of discipline because <laughs> yeah. you definitely can get caught by like, I, I, I mean, everybody's good to that. You get caught by the greed thing and all that. So yeah, you get FOMO, fear of missing out and everything too. It's, it's easy to fall into the hype, but just, you know, it's best to just sit on your hands you know, if you missed, if you missed it, there's always another play. There's always another play. So don't be afraid to not even trade that particular stock, even if it's moved on up and everything. Don't don't fall into the FOMO trap. Just just relax and let it let it die down, or or look for another play. You know, and and analyze and leverage your risk and reward according. You know, in accordance to that. Um, you know and. I just try to look at every angle, any angle that I can. Um, you know, it's it's all about protecting. At the end of the day, it's protecting yourself. Uh, go down. You know, don't go for crazy profits either. I think that's in uh, the book Intelligent Investor as well. I mean, just yeah. don't just don't fall into it and. You know, I, what I like to do and everybody's different is just find kind of beaten up stocks or, or downtrended stocks and have good fundamentals and technicals and and based off of that and go in, if especially long term, I mean, you know, I, I think I have risk reward, you know, who's under management and I looked under those particular each individual I have they have a lot of background in publicly traded stocks or what, you know, what companies have they previous work for Um the number of shares that an institution may have, and that may be Vanguard and, and Goldman Sachs and everything. But how, the other thing is, you know, how much of a percentage of shares do hedge funds have? They typically have a shorter term stance on these stocks. So if there's a lot of shares that these hedge funds own, that's a part of that company, most likely they're probably betting on it going up within a short period of time, of about six to 12 months. Um, so they're going to get in, get out, and then how many shares are outstanding so the public can trade those shares um, on a day-to-day -day marketplace. So, and then you know, I always look at you know how much debt does this company have? How much do they have in at you know in assets and liabilities? And how much debt are they in? So a lot of these smaller companies, you know, debt's not usually a good thing. But these larger companies or mid-sized companies, debt's actually debt can actually be a very good thing because they're trying to expand their business. If they, if they can expand their business, then you know maybe they're pur purchasing more fixed assets. Remember, or maybe they're they're expanding into better management. If that is part of their narrative, then it might be a good chance to uh, to buy into that company. Um, and then I always keep saying, you know, what's the company's narrative? Is it changing? Like GameStop, was it, you know, I thought it was going to change over time. Now it's going to take a long time. And that's what I was planning on, but the stock happened to ramp up and, you know, you, you got to take profit at, at those numbers. But I just got lucky with that. Extremely lucky. Um, and then, you know, what industry, what sector they're in, um, you know, who's the leaders of that sector? You know, how have they done in the past? How, you know, how can they get gain a competitive advantage? What's their niche? What's that company's niche against the largest player within that respective industry? That's going to play a huge role. And, um, and then, you know, I wrote down, uh, there's easier ways to, to evaluate businesses in terms of all of that to make our lives easier. I use Calc, XML, you can do it online, equity net, 
and exit advisor. They'll calculate it all for you online and everything else, make your life easier. So you don't have to look, read through the 10 dash K, which is a form that shows you um, the company's uh, financial condition and goes into the nitty gritty numbers. Um, and I think, you know, one good, good, uh, real quick, one good story that falls into all those, my little list there is, you'll like this, Ollie, is uh, back in 2016, that's actually when I started investing the AMD. Hey, yes, sir. That's my, hey, that's my pick right now. Hey, y'all don't know about AMD, man. That's my <laughs> pick for like 2021 right there. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a great, 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 um, in my opinion, I guess I should say, None of this is financial advice. Actually, yeah, let me get that out there too. I mean, it's a little late for that, but <laughs> this is not, we are not financial advisors. This is just for, you know, educational information, entertainment. That's it. I mean, if it helps you along the way, cool. I would, I, I'm not going to tell you nothing. I wouldn't do, I believe Nick will either, but yeah, we're not financial advisors. We just happen to have been doing this for a while and that's about it. That's, that's it. And so, Back in 2016, I used to day trade AMD when it was ranging between $7 and $10. And then I looked, oh, started to look more into it. And then uh, I read that it had good management. Um, it had a lot of uh, shares with institutional money, had a lot of shares of it. The consensus was that I had a ton of upside. And then I started looking at the different processors because it's just like Intel, for example. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I even went as long as as far as going into uh, when I eventually moved down here into you know the micro center which is a large computing um, they sell compute a lot of computers PCs and computer parts um, as well as you know go in the best buy and everything I mean you always saw that sticker that says Intel on those computers individual computers but then that started to shift to AMD I was seeing AMD processors everywhere. The processors are cheaper from over from China. They're just as good. I kept reading up on it and doing, going into detail. And then eventually I was like, you know what? I think there's a shift here. And so I invested in that long-term. I've just held, I don't even look at the stock price because I know it's going to most yeah, likely they, go up. Yeah, they're taking a market price. share from everybody. They're pretty much, they're, they're taking over like Intel's market share. And I, mean, I know my video is like the leader. That's like, uh, it's like, like semiconductor stuff for anybody that don't uh, yeah. know. But uh, one thing I want to like point out because you know um, what Nick was saying is you know he just started seeing like and just his everyday environment and that's big. Like a lot of people like I'll tell them like we don't have to make this complicated. A lot of us, a lot of times we try to make this complicated and try to just find the next big pop. But I try to compare because I talk to a lot of people you know that are into like what do you know? Like a lot of people, you like Nike, you wear Nike, you buy all this Nike stuff. Like, okay, go invest in Nike. Great company, great financials. Like it's a billion yeah. dollar, multi-billion dollar company. They got, they got Jordan, they got all that. So, I mean, it's not a bad play. They, and then they do other stuff outside of that. And you just look at different things of that nature, management, you know, Phil Knight brought that company to what it is. So I just like, you know, that's the thing. Like, if you just notice something, you know, going on and like, even like Tesla, for instance, like, yeah, a lot of people think it's a car company. It's not more of a tech company, but still, as you start seeing more and more Teslas around, like that might just be like a spark to like, oh, okay, let me go look at this. You got, everybody has an iPhone. Okay. Let me go look at Apple. You know, a lot of y'all like to go to the club, pop bottles, drink Henny, you know, all that LVMH. You like the Louis Vuitton designer. So I try to like, we don't have to make it. So a lot of people, I think make it complicated and trying to find that next big thing. And I mean, that's cool. Like you, you found some great things that's pop. I mean, I'm like 500% return on uh, Tesla and stuff like that. But I mean, I it's just like different things like that. It's, it's all right. Like, I mean, it's, it's cool to have that, but most of the stuff I invest in, I don't, I, yeah, I do the SPACs and stuff, which SPACs is more just like a blank check company. It's a, it's a different way to IPO a company. I won't go into too much detail because that's a bit more, if you're not getting at a ten dollar floor, that's a bit more riskier play. So we won't even. I don't want to. I don't want to drop people to <laughs> go try that out. But it is good money. It's quick money if you like that. Uh, thing. I kind of tried to get out of the quick money plays, but I'm just glad you mentioned that. Like, what drew you to it was just kind of what you were seeing in your natural, like everyday day to day. Yeah, you start I mean, to see that take over. It's it's a good way to just start and look at start to look into companies and then see who their competitors are 
and then, you know, kind of go from there. There might be somebody, if you are looking in the weeds, I mean, look at their competitors. Who's, who's the smaller players in that? Is there a lot of upside? I mean, you know, it, it all trickles down, but at least it, it, it sparks your interest, like you're saying, you know, and then that'll get you more interested. And then it makes it way easier to do your due diligence and, and looking up that information, taking the time to do it. I mean, it's worth your time because if you don't take the time, if you don't prepare, then you're preparing to fail. And, you know, you're going to put your own hard, hard earned money into something to try to make more and let it work for you. But why wouldn't you prepare for that and just go in there blindly at that time? You're just, you might as well flip a coin and then you're gambling, but you best better put yourself in the best position as possible um, and make the most of it. So, And then a the question I got, uh, um, <laughs> Um, just in regards to, you know, somebody new coming into it because it's not like I was ever big in stocks. I mean, I've seen it. I've heard about it. You know, listen, I always speak about it all the time. For somebody new trying to get into, you know, doing trades, making trades, I mean, how big is it? I guess, what would you recommend in regards of the amount of companies they may want to invest in from the get-go compared to, because I know there's a million and one companies. We see a lot of different products, you know, trying to juggle on which one instead of us jumping in all of them, you know, maybe one or two, I guess I'm just trying to get an understanding on what would be the best advice for somebody new coming in to kind of maybe focus on something small before they start trying to jump into, you know, bigger diversification. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the best way and it's pretty, you know, maybe it's cliche or not, but I mean, just look at all the larger players, like, like you said, look at, what you do every day and I you know I can't give a certain number of companies but I mean start with five look at them look into them see the history really tells everything else too look at the history you know if you if you do love Nike I'm a big proponent of what Ollie just said too I mean you know look into the companies that you enjoy then you're going to enjoy investing into them and you understand that if they are a good company, if they're a large player in the space, like Nike, like we, you know, Louis Vuitton, whatever, it's going to make your life easier. And it's going to, you know, rather than trying to look at these smaller companies and they may be, you know, there's a lot of games that are being played between the institutions. Again, you know, this game is meant for the retailers, everyday people like us to lose. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you, and we all saw that through GameStop and everything. So I would start with, you know, five stocks. Once you're comfortable with five stocks or investing into five stocks, you know, then, then go on and go in and look at, you know, probably five to seven and just gradually ramp, you know, understand the history of the company, understand how the management works, how that company works in, in detail, in my opinion, get comfortable with it and you should be comfortable with it if you use it every day if you have an interest in them every day how do they move you know and based on how they move is how you should move and uh if that makes sense and i think it that will keep your you interested and and being able to put in the time and work into it that's necessary but i would start with five in my opinion and then once you're comfortable with those companies go up to seven and then ten um, and once you have a good solid 10 companies that you're kind of looking at, maybe even invest in the five, you know, and then you're just kind of doing your due diligence with another five, then, you know, if you're run, if your list is starting to get short and everything, and then, then look at their competitors. So if you're looking at Nike, then look at Adidas, look at some of the other guys right. and see, see how they work. Um, that, that would be my, my suggestion, or in my opinion, that's what I would that's what I would do. And then it, it, is, yeah. it just goes on, on from there. Then you can get into the nitty gritty with these smaller companies and try to find the one that's underneath. But the key thing is to understand their history, getting, learning how to get that information. And that information will be a lot easier because that sparks your interest. And right. so then it trickles on down. And then eventually, once you do it enough and do it, you know, repeating, it's like owning, you know, refining your craft you know, in, in football or in, in general life, in your own respective profession. Mm -hmm. And as long as you continue to practice your craft and, and learn one little nugget 
no matter how large it is or how small it is every single day, um, you just continue to stack those nuggets and, and eventually you'll have a full understanding and, or a better understanding overall, and you'll continue to improve every single day. That's, that's my two cents. Oh, that's uh, you just hit it on the nail. Uh, just one more thing, like I'll add to it real quick. Like what I like to do and like who I kind of like the, the people I run with in this space, what we tend to do is like have a, like a lot of people love to find like the good things about a company or why they'll be good. Like I guess a bull case per se, right? That's what we'll call it. You know, and that's basically just saying like we talk bulls is like price rising and, and you know, basically you're saying the price is going to go up. But also you got to understand like you have to be realistic with yourself. A company may not be what you think it is. Like you might be super in love with a company, but you need to understand like it has a bear case against it too, which will drive it down. Like, yeah, you have catalysts for, you know, success and for a possibility and a spike in price, but you also have things that will negatively impact things. Um, so I just want to say, uh, take that into consideration too. And I mean, that's kind of how people I run with, and you know, in this space, that's kind of how we do stuff. I mean, that'll, that'll give you, that'll give you enough homework to do like, to where it's like, okay, I have a case against why I believe this is going to go up, but also have this case against, you know, it's just like a pros and cons list. So mm -hmm. you have to, I, I say just break it down on that uh, round and it makes it a lot easier for you to sleep at night and, and be able to like say, okay, cause again, we put in like money, like nobody wants to lose money. The name of the game, it's, it's one rule to invest it, just don't lose money. And if you want to go to the second rule, just look back at rule number one. So, I mean, that, that's it. That's the name of the game, don't lose money. And when we start talking about putting our money in, we need to start looking at every, every which way. Like it's the same as if I told you right now, like, hey, come give me, you know, five grand, I'm gonna go make you this. Well, you're gonna question the hell out of me and make me prove to you why you should give me that money to go grow it for you. And then you're gonna also try to figure out a reason as to why I'm not the best option. So that's kind of just how I would break it down to people like on a, on a simple thing. Like Nick was mentioned, like a lot of people don't really take it into consideration because you know you might buy a stock, but they might the stock might have seasonality to it where it may go down like in, in a certain time of the year. And if you don't do your research, you might just be thinking, like, well, damn, this stock is just getting crushed. Like, what's going on? Well, really, it could just be that time of the year. Just this is just a natural cycle it takes. And again, he mentioned the hedge fund money and the big money, like that then again, mm -hmm. that's that's the battle. Like we're we're definitely not meant for this. Like we're not meant to be in this game. We just get to play on the sidelines like that and it kind of just dip in and dip out as we please. But yeah, this stock market stuff isn't really made for us. It's made for the big people with big money. So that's some, I mean, if you know, that's what I would say looking into. And I mean, he gave you all a couple of uh, websites to use. I mean, if you want to look at big money, I use Well Wisdom. I've used uh, Quirkcoin. If you want to go a different route and you might not want to just look at individual stocks, you also have the route of, uh, I always tell people you got ETFs which makes it a lot easier on you because a lot of times we get so caught up and I got caught up in this. You start looking at all these, because once you start looking at a stock and once you really put money into this, you're going to go down a rabbit hole and you're going to start looking at like 10, 15, 20. My list is ridiculously long. I've, I've posted it on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and stuff. And you'll start looking at all these different companies and just get overwhelmed. So, I mean, why to me, it's like, what's the point of me investing and all these companies trying to be a hedge fund manager when I could just go buy into, you know, an ETF and let them do, they've already done the heavy lifting for you. So you can just go look at what they're invested in. And, and I mean, the big part, like I'm big on Kathy Wood. She's just a beast in her own right. And, you know, a lot of people like Warren Buffett and stuff, but he's old school. I like Kathy Wood. She's, she's more on my realm because she's all about disruptive things and, and innovation. And that's kind of already in line with what I try to look for. Like the next thing that's going to really like, be impactful. So I mean, you got Kathy Wood. She has all the ARK investment funds. Y'all want to sign up for her. Uh, she has like a newsletter daily that goes out, literally breaks down what they, what the company bought for that day. So, I mean, that to me is pretty uh, invaluable information, but you can all start, that might put something on your radar, you know, that you wasn't even looking into, especially with Kathy Wood, cause they're always looking for something disruptive. And then I guess uh, another question I had, I guess what, you know, just kind of going back when, before you started doing trading in college, as you were saying, what was something that motivated you to, you know, want to, you know, kind of put your nose in, into this realm of, you know, trading, making additional money, you know, by, I guess, having money, making money on it, you know, while you're not 
having to, you know, do the work or anything in the matter. I guess what what motivated you to want to take that step in, in this specific realm? You know, it, I'd be lying if at my initial thought when I could get into the stock market was to to make make money. That was the main thing. But then that my mind started to quickly shift uh, from that, and uh, you know, learning and and continuing to learn in, in a very short time is you know I quickly I, um, I think it satisfied my competitive nature more so than anything else. You know, I come from my background. You know, has always been involved until I got out of college was with sports, and you know, there's always a winner and there's always a loser on each side of the trade. There's always a buyer. There's always a seller. There's always somebody on one side of the trade and on the other. And if you know, you may or may not be right, um, but you know, I think it's more so it's making the right trade the very next time. And no matter what, you know, protecting my downside more so than anything else and, and being able to compete in the marketplace um, is, is what it was my main motivator. And as long as I, you know, took profit and didn't get greedy and, and no matter how large or how small it is, you know, I quickly learn. I also tried to just make, you know, can't get hurt by hitting a bunch of single bases and everything. And that doesn't mean you're, you know, as long as your batting average is 300, I mean, you're in the hall of fame. Right. And um, you don't, you don't have to nail a home run every single time is my point. Mm -hmm. And I was going for the home run at first and um, that, that's just not the way to approach trading in general, but uh, I guess, to go back, you know, it's, it's just my competitive nature in all, in all honesty. That, that was it. That was it. And then the money will follow at the end of the day. I just focus on making a good trade and make, think about the money. Don't think about the percentages or anything like that. So as long as you do your analysis and do your due diligence, everything else will take its course, in my opinion. Um, don't think about how much you, you can make and, and won't make. Just... Mm -hmm. Just focus on the focus on good trading, focus on the good companies, focus on your own companies, focus on your own strategy, and everything else will take its place. Okay. And I, right. guess, well, I guess one more question just to ask because I know I've done a lot of research in regards of I guess this being more of like a mental game. And I guess how big is that just within this specific space on I guess being clear on your decisions on, you know, <clears throat> making the proper trades that you want to. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say probably 90% of it, it's mental, in all honesty. And I know that if I'm not good mentally or if I have some type of emotion, if I'm feeling some type of way or if I'm not in the right mindset that day, I won't go on a trade. I won't do it. So mm -hmm. I don't want that to affect my training. You can't you can't be set on your emotions and you can't be um, once you, once you do get, if you are, I mean, we all have our days, you know, if you do get emotional, then that's going to reflect your trading for that specific day. It's best to just sit on your hands and not trade and don't force it. Like I said, there's, there's always going to be another play. There always is no matter what. And um, there's no reason to, to trade and get emotional about it. And, and if you're not in the right mindset, then, then stay away from it. And just, uh, you know, the main thing is just be calm. And I think, again, you know, as long as you do your due diligence and, and do your homework, you know, you're going to better put yourself in a position to, to succeed in this. And that's, that's the key thing. It's all, it's all in the preparation, just like any kind of game plan for, for football or, or any, mm -hmm. sport, you know, gotcha. So, Hopefully, hopefully that answered your question. I don't know. I definitely did. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my brother, I want to appreciate you, man. I want to I want to thank you for coming on, man. Just dropping some knowledge because you know, hey, it's, it's tough out here, people. And a lot of people are starting to get attracted to this uh stock market. So it's it good is. to have somebody come on. Yeah, no, I appreciate you all having me on. And if there's anything, you know, that I can provide or anything like that, I mean, off off air, just just let me know. I'm more than happy to help. More than happy to help anybody, you know. I mean, this is 
a very complicated game and they make it complicated. So the retailers day to day people like you and I can, can lose. But uh, I think the main thing is sharing that knowledge, sharing that wealth of information. So we all come together and uh, eventually succeed and, and be better prepared for this marketplace. So. Well, since you mentioned, can you go ahead and plug plug all your information in so anybody who listens to this that want to hit you up can go flush your deals that they do mine. <laughs> um, you can follow me on Twitter, NC Kaufman, C O F F M A N. Um, my Facebook's, uh, you know, Nick Kaufman. Um, my Instagram is NC C O F F M A N 90. Um, yeah, feel free if you want to message me on all those platforms. I think my my profiles are probably public right now. So, but um, again, you know, I'm more than happy to help or answer any questions. You know, I know I can often get too technical and everything, but that's just because I've been doing this for a while. But um, I'll try. You know, if I don't know the answer, I'll try to find you the answer, um, and, and so on and so forth. So. Anything I can do to help, you know, just let me know. I'm more than happy to. Appreciate you again, my brother. Appreciate, Appreciate you. Appreciate y'all. All right, thanks. Same to you. Later.